Bitter Side of Sweet, Chapter 13. Damn it! I level one savage kick of frustration at the nearest tree trunk, and then I grab Khadijah by the hand, and we raced into the clearing. No point in hiding now. Our only hope is to get Sadu into the bush before anyone catches us. I could strangle myself for giving in to the urge to light that second fire. The smoke will bring the bosses back sooner. The odds of our escaping are getting smaller and smaller by the second. I curse myself, curse my brother, curse this whole misbegotten day, and wish like crazy that I could start again and do things differently. Say do, I shout. What the hell do you think you're doing? With all the racket he's made with the shovel and the noise from inside the hut, I don't even care that I'm shouting. Sadu looks at me, his eyes shining with fever and tears, sweat leaving tracks in the dirt on his face. You said we wouldn't, you wouldn't save them. He's crying now, sobbing the words out between labored breaths. He's barely able to muster the strength to lift the shovel off the ground. He swings it weakly in his one remaining hand. The shovel makes a pitiful thump when it slides into the door. But I'm not going to leave them here, Amadou. We can't leave them here. I want to slap him to his senses. How are we to escape if we waste time like this? But I can see the rebellion in Sadu's face, and I realize that there's a quick way and a slow way to get him away from that door. And though it goes against all my better judgment, the quick way is to let him win. When I grab the shovel from him, Sadu cries out, thinking I'm going to make him leave. But instead, I drop my machete, push him to the side, and heft the shovel. I catch Khadijah's eyes. She wraps her arms around Sadu, pulling him from me. He struggles weakly against her, but she's bigger than him, and she doesn't let go. I glare at the rusted padlock. It whispers to me, of all the nights I spent in that hut, heard the click of the lock and despaired. All the anger of the day, all the frustration, all the fear, I put them into my swing, using my whole body to bring the blade of the shovel onto the lock. With a ripping of wood, the screws that hold the latch in place are yanked out. The padlock, still shut tight, falls harmless at my feet, and the door swings open. Inside, I meet the stunned eyes of 12 boys. They take in the curls of smoke drifting over the hill. Khadijah, with her arms wrapped around Sadu to my right, and me, with a shovel on my shoulder, standing in the swinging door with its ruined lock, the tool shed, a blazing pyre behind me. Yusef steps forward, his huge eyebrows raised comically on his skinny face. This is the best chance you'll ever get to run, I say, dropping the shovel at his feet and retrieving my machete. Do whatever you want, but don't follow us. And with that, I scoop Sadu into my arms, grab Khadijah by the hand, and run from the clearing as fast as I can. We make it past the first line of trees before I look back. The camp is in chaos. A few boys are already disappearing into the bush, each in a different direction. Others seem to have decided not to run, and they're sitting in the doorway to the sleeping hut, staring at the burning ruin of the tool shed, looking lost without the lock. Yusef stands in the middle of the clearing, giving orders to a small band of boys to collect the things they will need. I meet his eyes once more, and he nods. Thanks. I feel a strange stretching in my cheeks and realize that I'm smiling. I nod back, wishing him luck and then turn into the bush with my little family and vanish. Since the bosses are still at their house, I let us walk along the piste, leading away from the camp for about 10 minutes. I'm stumbling from sheer exhaustion. Khadijah's injured, and after his exertions with the shovel, Saidu is barely conscious. Right now, none of us have the energy to fight our way through the bush, but when I look over the tree traps and see that there's only one plume of smoke, I make us leave the road. The going is terribly difficult, and soon we have to walk with Sadu slung between us. Half an hour later, Khadijah stops and rubs her back. Amadou, can we take a break? She asks. It's the first time she's complained. No, I say, sighing. I pull the almost empty water bottle out of my pocket and hand it to her. Here, drink this. It might help. She looks crushed, but she takes the water from me without a word. She drinks, and I pull Sadu against me so that she only has to move her own weight. We keep walking. Sadu is getting heavier and heavier in my arms, and I have to keep shifting my grip so that I don't drop him.
but as it is, he's barely dragging himself along beside me, clutching his ruined arm in front of him, so I don't ask him to walk by himself. After another hour of this, we're tripping and falling every few steps, and even though it feels far too close to camp to let our guard down, I give in. Okay, let's take a quick rest, I say. I carefully part the greenery that shoves up against us like living walls and lead us deeper into the bush, smoothing the traces of our passage the best I can. We settle and Sadu slumps into the damp ground. I groan. It feels so good to let go of him. I'm soaked in sweat from where he's been leaning against me. I didn't realize how hot he was. He must be feverish again. It's too depressing to think about. I untie the shirt I stole from the boss's house from around my waist and pull it over Sedu's head. I have no idea what the bosses did with his shirt when they took him to their house. After it had been used as a bandage for so many days, they probably had to burn it. The boss's shirt is huge on Sedu, and the sleeve I ripped off to start the fire doesn't line up with his injury, so he has a full arm sticking out of a damaged sleeve and a damaged arm stick sticking out of the full sleeve. I sigh. He looks ridiculous, but at least he's got a shirt on now. If nothing else, it covers the scars on his back, so I don't have to look at them anymore. Then I peel off my own shirt and drape it over a low bush to dry and let the air wash against my skin. Sedu lies where I left him, eyes closed and slightly sunken, chest heaving in and out inside his oversized shirt with the effort of staying alive. Khadijah is pressing her palms to her cheeks to cool her face. She pokes the edge of her shirt into the empty water bottle to gather what little moisture is left in it, then uses the corner to wipe away some of the grime on her face. I look at the trees around us. The boss's farm stretches in the opposite direction, so we're already past the tended groves, but there are still a few cacao trees scattered around. The birds must have carried some seeds out here. I heave myself to my feet and pull myself to the nearest one that has ripe pods on it. I cut one off, split it open, and bring it to Khadija. Chewing the seeds is gruesomely familiar, but we need the moisture and the energy. Sedu refuses to eat, glaring at Khadija and breathing shallowly. I look up from trying to force him when Khadija sighs. We can't keep going like this, you know, she says. What? There's no way we can keep running with you half carrying Sedu and me barely able to keep up. We don't have any food or water, and if we don't get far enough away from the camp, they'll catch us. I flop onto my back. I know, but I don't know what else to do. We have to keep moving. The sparkle in her eyes when she looks at me is a surprise. I never said we should stop moving. I said we should stop moving slowly, she smiles. I'm too tired for these games. I want to sleep for a week. Well, prompts Khadija, poking me in the side. Aren't you going to ask how? I groan, eyes closed. Life was bad enough when I only had one kid to pester me. Fine. How are you going to get us out of here quickly? She smiles. On the Pistur's truck, she says. My eyes crack open. She has my attention. This has got to be the worst idea ever. I hiss at Khadija from our hiding spot behind a big copse of trees. Even worse than my ideas. Shush, you're just jealous you didn't come up with it first, she says. I scowl and hold Sadu tighter against my side. He tries to push away, but I don't let him. I am not jealous that I didn't come up with this idea first. It's madness. However, as we crouch here, too near the dusty truck track for comfort, I have to admit that there's a faint chance I might get jealous, if it works. There are a lot of ifs. If the Pasteur stayed behind to help the bosses put, the, put out the fire for long enough that we're still ahead of him, and if he doesn't decide to spend the rest of the day at the farm, and if he hasn't joined the search party, and if he doesn't take some other trail we don't know about, and if we don't get caught or killed before he gets here, then maybe Khadija's plan has a chance of working. When I hear the rumble of an engine in the distance, at first, I can't believe my ears. Then all my muscles tense. Sedu stops struggling. Khadija holds her breath. My eyes dart around the path in front of us. A large branch is blocking the road as if it had fallen there. 
all of our footprints are carefully smoothed out. The leaves and bushes to the sides of the road have been carefully rearranged so that it doesn't look like anyone has been through them. The noise gets louder. There's no way you should be able to tell that we set up the roadblock, but even so, my heart hammers in my ears. I duck my head out of sight as the Pastor's pickup truck rounds the bend. When it slows, I have to remind myself that this is what we wanted. This is what we planned. He's not coming to find you, I repeat in my head over and over again as I hear the truck slow to a stop a little ways past us. I hear the metallic creaking of the driver's door opening. I hear him curse to himself as he surveys the branch. A shove on the side of my head makes me focus again. Khadija waves wildly, pointing at the road. Right. This is no time to get lost in daydreaming about what the driver's doing. I peek around the side of the tree and see the pasteur grab one end of the branch to haul it out of his way. His blue shirt pulls, pulls across his huge chest as he does so. He's even bigger up close. Focused on the task, he's facing away from the road behind him. I grab Sadu by his good arm and grip my machete in the other, my hands suddenly sweaty. We scramble as quietly as we can through the bush, Khadija behind us. Carefully, we creep up the red dirt track to the back of the truck. I let go of Sadu long enough to make a platform with my hands for Khadija's foot and boost her into the small space left on the floor of the truck between the tower of burlap sacks and the tailgate. Musa won't be pleased we couldn't fill the truck all the way. The thought flits through me like a butterfly through a sunbeam, a flash, then gone. Khadija safely inside, I hand her my machete and then grab Sadu around the waist. As I do, I peek between the tires and what I see makes my heart stop. The road ahead is already clear. The Pasteur managed to move the branch in the few minutes we've already used, and now the toes of his boots are walking to his open cab door. They only have a few seconds before he drives off and leaves us. Hurriedly, I boost Sadu as high as I can. Khadija grabs him under the armpits, looping her arms around his chest. He braces his bad arm away from her, moaning softly. Just as I hear the driver's door close and the engine cough to life, I realize Sadu's not strong enough to hoist himself up and Khadija's not strong enough to pull him inside. Panic flashes over Khadija's face, mirrored. I'm sure by mine. I hear the groan of gears and scrabble at the truck, leaving Khadija to hold Sadu's weight alone. The truck lurches forward. Khadija's straining with the effort of holding my brother off the road, but I can't help her. I'm gripping the top of the tailgate with only my fingertips, jogging behind the truck, trying to jump up and get a toehold on the bumperless back. I need to get in, but the truck is bad. Ruined the track is bad, ruined by runoff, and each jostle of the truck over the rough piste threatens to knock me loose. The idea of losing my chance for freedom and my brother makes me try even harder. I gather every ounce of strength I have left in me and heave myself in. As soon as I land, I whirl around to where Sadu's dangling, slapping against the tailgate with every bump. Luckily, the Pistura's truck is so old its motor is loud enough to cover his cries. I lean dangerously far out and link my arms under his armpits. Khadija lets go and worms from between us. I brace against the truck and lever Sadu in. Just then, the truck hits a particular bad pothole and lurches to the side, sending the three of us flying to land in a heap against the wall of burlap sacks, protecting us from discovery. Amadou, Sadu gasps, his face pulled tight by the pain. Ow, Amadou, ow! and push myself into a sitting position and lift him off my chest so that he's not lying on his arm anymore. I rub his back with my free hand. Shh, Sadu, it's okay. I'm startled to realize that for the first time in months, I may not actually be lying to him. Why does it still hurt? He sobs, his eyes glazed with pain and fever take in the unfamiliar setting. The small, clear triangle of corrugated metal we're sitting in the sacks around him, the sun blazing down. I don't know, I say, feeling my panic fade like the nighttime bush noises do at dawn. But it's going to be okay, Sadu. We're getting out. I'll make it better, I promise. Hurry, says Sadu, 
head resting hot and sticky on my chest, crusty bandaged arm cradled protectively between us. Looking over his head, I see the rutted trail behind us being slowly swallowed by the bush. I lean against the sacks and feel a smile pulling at the sides of my mouth. I close my eyes and say, okay, now I'm jealous I didn't come up with this first. Beside me, I hear Khadijah laugh. And so we sit, battered and exhausted, propped together in the lurching truck as the pastor unknowingly drives us to freedom.